run. Take your Bibles, turn the book of Luke again tonight. I'll hold along in another parable. Now this one, a little uh, disturbing, I guess, and it's it's application to Christians tonight. And may God help us that we'll see something in it that'll speak to our hearts and challenge us. I always, uh, when I get to a, a, a message of this sort, I, I preach it, and I, I preach sometimes uh, uh, hesitantly, and I, I don't say that as uh, being negative about the message. It's just it speaks so much to my heart, and I see so many areas in my life where I need to move up and make adjustments. And when I see that, then I, I think, boy, it's hard, Lord, to preach that because so much of it is coming right back to me. And I pray that God will open up our hearts tonight, speak to all of us in a special way. Luke chapter 13, verse number 6. Here you have the parable of the barren fig tree. The parable of the barren fig tree. You found your place. Let's stand. We'll read these three, four verses together. The Bible said he spake also this parable. Certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. He came to inspect it, basically. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Father, help us tonight and speak to my heart. You talk in the book of John about us bringing forth more fruit and much fruit. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be fruitful Christians, fruitful individuals in your vineyard, working for you until one day when you call us from this walk of life or you come in the clouds of glory and take us home. We're not to sit by idly doing nothing. So, Lord, I pray, help us and use us and <clears throat> speak to all of our hearts and touch us and may we respond accordingly tonight and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 You be seated. The story tells us that a owner possessed a vineyard and he takes and has his vine dresser plant a fig tree in this vineyard. And since it's his vineyard, he has every right to expect fruit to be born on that fig tree. Would you agree with that? Belong to him, he had every right to expect fruit. Now the tree has grown to full maturity in the very best of places. It has been tenderly taken care of. It has had the best possible care available for it. And yet we get this sad uh, story. Now notice something. It doesn't say he comes to gather fruit. He just comes to expect the fruit. He's going to see if it's right. He's going to see if it's unright. He's going to see if it's good. He's going to see if it's bad. He's going to see if it's abundant. He's going to see if it's small. And you could go on and on to look the fruit over and see if it's ready to be picked. And the Bible said he found none. What a sad story. There wasn't any to be found, so he found none. And so what's the trouble? Is the trouble with the owner? Is the trouble with the vine dresser? Is the trouble with the vineyard? I don't think there's a problem with the owner. I don't think there's a problem with the vine dresser. And I will identify who the owner and the vine dresser are in just a minute. I don't think there's a problem with the vineyard. Now, here it comes. Well, apparently, this tree was just a good-for-nothing tree. 
Amen? Amen. Well, if you apply that to Christians, we'd say there's a few Christians that are just good for nothing Christians. Amen. God help us. Right. Now comes the crucial question in this whole parable. Is the state of unfruitfulness permanent or is it temporary? Now you get that. This wasn't an isolated inspection. He's visited this vineyard periodically during the past three plus years and during all the previous visits he found no fruit on the tree. <coughs> we'll all have times of unfruitfulness. Mm -hmm. right? God help us that we don't. But we'll all have times of unfruitfulness. And if God judged us strictly on those moments, we'd all be in serious trouble, wouldn't we? Thank God he doesn't just judge us on those particular moments alone and only because we'd all be in a mess. We all have times of unfruitfulness, and if God judged us then, what a problem we'd have. However, this state, if the state of unfruitfulness, if it's permanent, if it is a permanent condition, then we are in serious trouble. Because God wants you and I bearing fruit. Right. The owner comes and seeing the barren fig tree says cut it down. What he basically is saying, why should I let this unfruitful tree continue to occupy ground that could be better occupied by a fruitful tree? If it's not going to bear fruit, I didn't plant it there for a shade tree. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't plant it to sit under and look at it and say, boy, that thing sure is pretty. I planted it that it might bear fruit. Yeah, and so he said, it's not doing me any good. It's not bearing fruit. Cut it down. But wait a minute. Verse 8 says, let it alone this year also. Till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, I'll cut it down. It may seem on the surface that there is a disagreement between the owner and the vine dresser. When we hear the owner give this order, the vine dresser urges delay. But it isn't the case whatsoever because the owner at once consents to the delay. Did he not? Yeah. Here we see the long-suffering of God illustrated. Now, the owner in this parable is undoubtedly God himself. Yeah. The vine dresser in the parable is undoubtedly Jesus Christ. Aren't you, got, aren't you glad you have somebody that intercedes on your behalf today? And you know, we talk a lot of times about preaching to, or praying to Jesus and nothing wrong with what our thoughts is there. But folks, listen, we are praying to God and we have an intercessor or a mediator a go-between between us and God, and that mediator is none other than Jesus Amen. Christ the righteous. The Bible said we have a great high priest. He's ascended into the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's ever making intercession for you and I. Amen. The Bible also tells us that we don't know how to pray as we ought to. I don't know what to ask for a lot of times to you. But the Holy Spirit, through moanings and groanings, takes our pleas and our petitions into the throne room of Almighty God. And what we need most is carried to the bottom. Yeah, amen. I'm glad of that. Yeah. Now, the owner again is God. The vine dresser is Jesus. The idea here isn't that God is severe and Jesus alone is merciful. Well, the Father quickly accepts the intercession of Jesus. We should always, now listen to me right here, we should always see both sides of the ball. He is a stern and severe judge, and he's a patient and loving Lord. Now what a lot wants you to preach is about the patient and loving Lord. Are you with me? Don't preach about that judgment and about that hellfire and brimstone, 
fact, I had a lady tell me one time and her husband was a minister and I had a track and I was I, I shared it with her and asked her if she'd like to look at it and she said this, if that's one of those hellfire and brimstone tracks, I don't want to see it. And I asked her, I said, what do you preach over at your church? We preach about love. God's a God of love. I have no problem with that. God is a God of love. But that same God is also a God of judgment as well. You can't get one side of God without getting both sides of God. And if I stood and preached one side and didn't preach you the other side, I wouldn't be giving you the whole counsel of the Word of God. God wants us to have it all. Amen. 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 So we need to see both sides. When you leave off either aspect of Him, you get a, distor <coughs> a distorted God. That's what you get. Now, Six things from the parable. Listen quickly and I'll preach fast, all right? God expects fruit, verse number six. He expects us to bear fruit. And a Christian ought to bear fruit wherever he, wherever he is, wherever he's at, he ought to be bearing fruit. Doesn't matter if he's at church, if he's at another church, if he's at school, if he's on the job and you could go on and on, he ought to be bearing fruit. This tree was an unfruitful ornament. God wants no ornaments. He wants fruit. He don't need you to be a shade tree. Amen. He wants you to bear fruit. Amen. And the only way the world can know that you're saved is by the fruit that you're continually bearing. You know, they've always said there's a contradiction in Scripture. Paul says we're saved by grace through faith. James says, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And some say Paul's teaching salvation by faith, and James is teaching salvation by works. That's not what they're doing. Paul is telling you that we're saved by grace through faith. But James is saying this. That the only way that the world is going to know that you have a salvation is by the works that you produce. Yeah. See, God can see my faith. He knows my faith. Can you see my faith? So I'm saved by grace through faith, and God knows the faith that I've placed in Him. Now, how can you know what I've got? By my works. By the fruit that I am bearing gives evidence that I've been saved by the grace of God. So there's no contradiction between what Paul's saying and what James is saying. So God expects fruit out of us. God wants us to be fruitful. And the only way the world's going to know you're saved is by the fruit that you're bearing. And by the way, bad fruit is also unacceptable to the owner. If he came and there was bad fruit on the tree, that wouldn't be acceptable either. Amen. Secondly, is God's patience and his expectations. Look at verse number seven. Three years represents a period of time. In that period of time, we see the patience and the long-suffering of God. I don't have to ask you this question, but let me ask it anyway. Aren't you glad we got a patient and long-suffering yeah. God? Amen. When you plant your garden, and some of you do because you brought me the fruits of your garden this past summer, and I want to tell you, I appreciate them. I appreciate every cucumber. I appreciate every tomato. I appreciate the squash. I appreciate, and I mean, it, I'm going to tell you, it has not gone to waste. It has been eaten. Could have brought me a few more peppers if you'd wanted to, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but when you plant your garden, do you plant it one day and expect it to bear fruit the next day? You've got to be patient. It'll take seven weeks for that garden to grow and to produce fruit. But bear they will. And Raymond, if they don't bear, what are you going to do with them? We'll dig it up. He plant you some more. They'll bear or else. You expect the tomato plants to bear tomatoes. You expect the cucumbers when they come up to bear cucumbers and on and on. You have every right to expect fruit if you give those plants time to produce. 
Here's what the parable is saying to us. God's patient. He saved you. He begins the nurturing process in your life in expectation that fruit will be forthcoming, that you will bear fruit. Let me ask you this. Are you bearing fruit tonight? However, we also learn that even God's patience can wear out. Look at verse 7. Just as three years illustrates his patience, his response at the end of those three years illustrates the end of his patience. All through Scripture we see this truth illustrated. Let me give you two or three. In Noah's day he was patient for 120 years. Then his patience wore out. In Pharaoh's time, he was patient for 80 years, and his patience wore out. Got him in the Red Sea and drowned him. His patience wore out. In the New Testament, when Judas was unfruitful, he was removed and replaced. And I know a lot of say different things about Judas Iscariot. We aren't going to get into that tonight. We'll use that some other time. This can be illustrated in your job, where you work. When you're unfruitful, you're removed and replaced. Or at least you ought to be. If you're not doing anything, why do they need you? It amazes me today. Folks think that they hire you on a job just to give you a place to work and give you a salary and pay you money. If they didn't need you to work, they wouldn't have hired you to begin with. Amen? amen. Say amen right amen. there. Amen. And that's what a lot of our young people assume today. Walmart hires people because they got to pay people because people got to have some money. If they didn't need you to do a job, they wouldn't have hired you to begin with. Yeah. Well, let me move off of that one. That's picking. That's my own bad one. The importance of intercession is found in verses 8 and 9. There's a song that said somebody or someone is praying for you. The, the song describes the ministry of intercession. That ministry of intercession is, is illustrated throughout Genesis 18. You remember how Abraham on the hillside was interceding not only for uh, his nephew Lot that was down there in Sodom and Gomorrah, but he was basically interceding for all of Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you realize that? He started out at 50. He said, Lord, if there are 50 righteous down there, you wouldn't destroy Sodom for 50 right? No, there's 50. He said, well, for venture, there will be 45 down there. He said, no, there's 45. I won't destroy it for 45. And he said, well, what about 40? Let's get her on down here to 40. And he said, no, if it's 40, I'll spare it. There's just 40 down there. And Abraham went on a little farther. He said, well, what if there's only 30? And he said, if there's 30, I'll spare it. He said, what about 20? He said, if there's 20, I'll spare it. He said, what about 10? Well, there's a significance to that number 10. I'm going to tell you why. There was Lot, there was Lot's wife. There were his sons, his daughters, his sons-in-law. You start that daughter's law, you add them all up. Go, in, go in back there and read. In Genesis 18, you get home tonight, go to add those up. Guess what the number is when you get done? I believe Abraham stood on that hillside and said, I know Lot's remained faithful. He's probably got a good free will Baptist church down there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're meeting, they're worshiping. There may only be, you like that one, didn't you? There may only be 10 of them, but I know there's 10 righteous down there. Gosh, he, they couldn't even 10 righteous be found. And God sent an angel and told Lot, you better get out of here. There's destruction coming. Lot got himself, his wife, his two daughters, and out of the city they come. And the angel said, when you leave, you get your eyes fixed on leaving and don't look back. And they started out of there and Lot's wife looked back. Lot's wife turned to a pill of salt. There's another message in that. Now, I'm going to get it into it, but I'm going to give you this right here. They got Lot's wife out of Sodom, but they were unable to get Sodom out of Lot's wife. Right. Right. And boy, there's a message in that right there. I'll get it to you some of these days. Uh, you'll like it when we get to it, but how true that is. Thank God. Listen to me. Lot would say this. And you say, well, what about Lot's 
spiritual condition. I'm only going to give you what the Bible says. You know what Peter said? Peter said, Lot was a righteous man vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. That's all I got to go by. And I'm going to tell you this. I don't believe Lot got Lot out of Sodom. I believe Abraham upon that hillside, interceding on his behalf, got him out of Sodom. Right. You better be thankful that somebody cared enough about you one day to start praying for you. Amen. Bring your name before God in prayer. Listen, I don't just pray for the lost. I pray and put people's names to it. And I don't care to ask God to make them a little uncomfortable. I'd rather see them more uncomfortable in this life than to spend an eternity uncomfortable yeah. in a place called Amen. Amen. So if God can toss them around a little bit in the bed at night and they lose a little of their sleep or they lose a few, uh, uh, their appetite at a few meals or they're uncomfortable going through life, man, that's better than spending eternity in hell. Right. I don't know about you, but I still believe in old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, God-sent conviction that can get a hold of people's hearts. Yeah. Got a hold of mine and it get a hold of yours. Yeah. <laughs> And it can still do it. Now, fifthly, what makes an unfruitful person fruitful? There's several things, but let me give you some. Dedication to God will enable the fruit of the Spirit to be manifest in your life. Dedication to God. How dedicated are you? Chastisement is another way the Lord deals with the unfruitfulness in His children. You ever had a good whipping from the Lord? Mm -hmm. yeah. My dad knew how to whip, but God does too. Yeah. If you've never been taken to the woodshed of the Lord... I invite you to stay as humble and close to God and obedient to Him as you can. Because when you step out of line, He's not going to let His children just step out of line and get, get away with it and go. He'll take you to the woodshed. And I'm glad He does. Yeah. Man. So, preacher, you like a whipping? No, I didn't like them when Daddy gave them to me, and I don't like them when the Lord gives them to me. But I believe this with all my heart. And I've heard parents say this. I'm going to whip my child because I want them to know I love them. If you want them to know you love them, then you'll discipline them when they do wrong. Amen. That's an evidence of a love. And the evidence that God loves you is when he chastens you and he whips you when you do wrong. That's evidence that he loves you. Deuteronomy 8 5 said, As a man chasing his son, so the Lord chasteneth thee. Then this message describes only one that comes, and that's affliction. The vine dresser says, I'll dig it up. There's a process known as pruning. You ever pruned a tree? Here's what the dictionary defines pruning as to remove dead or living parts from a plant so as to increase fruit or flower production or improve the fold. Another definition is to cut or get rid of a, as being unnecessary. Third, we need, there's a lot of pruning. We need to get rid of some unnecessary things. Do you know that? Yeah. Then the next thing is to reduce or diminish by removing what's unnecessary. And the Lord just may have to, listen, he may have to do some pruning work in our lives to make us more fruitful for him. And I pray tonight, God, prune me up. Get me to where I can be more fruitful in the vineyard of the Lord. Yeah, amen. And the Lord desires that all of us be fruitful. Now the sixth thing in life. God's judgments are irrevocable. They're inevitable. They're going to come. His judgments may be postponed briefly, but they will come. And let me give you one. The Lord told Hezekiah that he was going to die. Hezekiah prayed and God gave him 15 more years. But guess what? He died. Right. Ezekiel 24, 14, if the Lord have spoken it, it shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back. God will keep his promise. He's faithful. Amen. God will deal with each of us. He'll not allow the true Christian to remain unfruitful without dealing severely with you. I believe he'll deal with you in one of three ways. Now listen closely. The gentle ways pointed out in 1 John 1 9. You could probably quote this one. By the way, 1 John's written to Christians. Mm -hmm. Not talking to unsaved people. 
He said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Christians, Christians. So that's the gentle way. Gentle ways when he just taps on our heart and reveals to us that we've done something wrong and we respond and ask for forgiveness, that's the gentle way. Then there's a severe way. The Lord can send weakness or sickness into our lives. Only happens a lot of times, I think, well, most of the time, after you've ignored the gentle way, when God's tapped on your heart and you said no to it, then God has to go a little farther to get your attention. And by the way, it isn't, it isn't always the reason for sickness. Sometimes we get sick and it's not due to something. That, just ask Job. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Then there's the most extreme way that he can deal with us. God help us that we won't have, he won't have to go that far. He can just remove us, mm -hmm. cut us down, get us out of the way. So when he speaks to us in the gentle, still voice, may we hear and respond. Don't wait till he gets severe with us to get our attention. And my goodness sake, don't put him in the position of moving us out of the way. And he can do that. Be fruitful. Read John 15. The Lord wants you to bring forth fruit, much fruit, and more fruit. And one way that we bring forth fruit is this. The branches are non-existent unless they stay attached to the tree. Right. If we stay attached to him, he can use us in his glory. Well, that's one of them you say, man, why ain't they all that showing? Mm -hmm. well, I don't know, but this one was, that, that's what the Lord gave me in this one. But he sure got my attention. He wants me to bring for the truth. He wants me to be about his business. I know this. He's patient. He's patient. He's wear out with me. I don't want to bring him to the So how is it with you? God spoke to your heart. If he has, the best thing to do is respond from the gentle touch. Don't make him get harsher. He can. He will if he has to. But listen when he speaks to him. And respond when he speaks in the gentle way. Let's stay. Come on, Dad. Sing just a verse and the chorus. That's all we're going to do. God spoke to you hard. Y'all are kind. Y'all are kind. Listen to me while he speaks to you. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come while he waits for you. Need to say, Lord, prune me a little. I want to bring forth fruit. You may have to put some fruit in the little old man. Prune me up. Get me to where I can bring forth fruit for me. Suitable unto. take your pruning hook and put it to my life. And all them old dead branches that need to be pruned off, I pray you'll get rid of them. All that old unnecessary stuff that doesn't benefit me as a child of God, I pray that you'll help me to see it and to get rid of it out of my life. It's not doing me any service, any good as a child of God, and I pray help me, Lord, get rid of it. Then, Lord, just do what's necessary in and around my life. And Lord, that showing me every time that you begin to prune on my limbs, you still love me. 
and I'm still your child, and I'm still attached to, to the vine. I'm not some little old branch out there on my own, but I'm attached to you. Lord, when we, as long as we remain there, you'll trim us up when we need trimming. And I thank you that you love us that much. Amen. So, Lord, bless these that have come around this altar and others that may be right there in their seat and their pew praying. God help us get things out of our way that don't need to be there. Yes, and we'll thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, youngins, I love you. Appreciate you. How uh, dismiss you. I'll get on the phone and try to get a hold of Deb, and we'll see how she's uh, uh, doing. And I'll come back and give you an update if you want to do that. If you want to wait a minute, see.